I would like to thank the Association of Political Prisoners in Exile and the Prisoners of Conscience Appeal Fund for putting on this amazing event and for their dedication for years um, raising the voice of political prisoners in Iran and other authoritarian regimes like Burma and Zimbabwe who do not have freedom of speech and um, have, they do not have access to proper trials and the rule of law. We've just heard from Dariush and Shukufe and Masood of the grave and systematic human rights abuses that are taking place under the Islamic Republic of Iran. Today, we not only commemorate the tens of thousands that were brutally murdered in 1988, but all of those from left to right, from all different beliefs, religions, and ethnicities who have been detained, tortured, and executed. The title of my talk, the threat of another Iranian massacre and the responsibility to prevent. Because I think we now must look into the future, although it's quite important to document the cases of the past, it's important to look into the future and understand the crisis we face right now. The crisis of an Iran close to having nuclear capabilities at the hands of extremist Shia leaders who believe, if not welcome, the coming of the Mahdi, the supposed 12th Imam in hiding, who's supposed to emerge at a time of great chaos to bring salvation to the people, and the crisis of the existence of this theocratic regime, unafraid of massacring its own people in order to maintain control at all costs. These drive me to believe in the real threat of another massacre. Unless, of course, the international community hears the real cries of the Iranian people and does not recognize this illegitimate government. And unless the Iranians internally continue with this movement, not let this momentum die, and continue to engage in acts of nonviolent civil resistance. What goes on domestically and at the international level in the coming months, I think, is going to mark a significant period in history and, of course, which translates to world security. I receive thousands of letters from Iranians within sharing with me the pain and suffering that they experience on a daily basis in Iran. So I feel it's my responsibility to be here today to be their voice, to try to share their stories with you. I get these emails in bold in the subject line. It says, please help, please help us. So that's why I'm here today. I'm going to try to bring a human face to some of the atrocities that are taking place post and pre-June fraudulent 2009 elections and also try to end with some recommendations. As we've seen, since I'm sure all of you have been watching the news and you've seen all the brutalities that have taken place since the June 12th elections, but these human rights abuses are not new phenomena. We've seen with the videos, we know that people have been suffering for a long time, for the last 30 years plus, and this frustration and anger that Iranians have been feeling it's an ongoing thing, and the elections that took place were simply the fuel that added the fire that encouraged the millions of people to come out to the streets to protest. They felt like their vote was being insulted, that their voice was not being heard. Even within the confines of the Islamic Republic, they were not able to have their voice count. And one of the Islamic Republic of Iran's greatest fears is the threat of a velvet revolution. So they will do anything in their power to try to control this. 
And as a result, as we'd seen, innocent people were the victims. Hundreds of people were being um, knived and axed and their houses being um, ransacked and um, dormitories being raided, people being shot. As witnessed, Neda Ava Sultan was one of those victims, a beautiful, young, peaceful protester who was shot in the heart and whose life we saw pass before our very eyes. This is her picture. There was many deaths. The government has reported 30 official deaths. The opposition has claimed there's over 72, and others say that there, the deaths could be even in the hundreds. Many of those have been buried in unmarked graves. Whereas the street demonstrations have died down considerably, there are still demonstrations taking place at a smaller scale. The brutality certainly has not subsided. Hundred people right now stand on trial in show trials reminiscent of Stalin's 1930 show trials. There are human rights defenders, opposition candidates, journalists that are being detained right now. And uh, many are being forced to make false forced confessions implicating, of course, the US, Israel, and Britain. 4,000 people were initially detained since June 12th. Um, although many have been released, there are still many that are suffering. And then, of course, there are those who have disappeared and whose whereabouts are unknown. There are those who have died, like Sohraba Arabi, whose mother only found out 26 days after Besiji had killed her son, that her son was dead. Families have have been having to fetch their child's body from so-called cold houses. They're not even proper morgues. Their child's frozen bodies are handed to them, provided they sign on the dotted line, which does not implicate the government in the death or blaming others for the death of their children. There are, there are people like Amir Javed Gifar, who's 24 years old, and he died in custody after he was brutally tortured. He had blows to the head and evidence of extracted nails. There are those like Tarana Musavi and Saida Puragai. Tarana Musavi, she was um, detained or um, arrested at a peaceful protest. Saida Puragai was just chanting the daily ritual chanting Allah Akbar on top of her roof. On separate occasions, they were both imprisoned. Um, they were brutally gang raped by um, Basijis and then had acid thrown on their bodies to try to hide the evidence. There's people like 15 year old Reza who was arrested for wearing a green wristband similar to the one I'm wearing right now because of this. He was sodomized continuously for 20 days in prison by prison guards in order to get him to confess to crimes that don't exist. These are not crimes. Upon his relief, he said, my life is over. I don't think I can ever recover. There are many people who don't recover. There are people who've experienced similar things to Reza, like another boy who, upon release, after his father paid a heavy bail fine, took his own life because he couldn't li live with this pain. Opposition president candidate uh, Mehdi Karubi publicly announced that these rapes were taking place. He acknowledged this. And as a result, government forces raided his office, stole files containing private information of these human rights abuses, and now he faces the threat of possibly being arrested. That's the speculation right now. Same with people like the other presidential candidate, um, Musa, Mir Hussein Musavi. They'd be charged for advocating against the state. Another frightening occurrence is the existence of a website called Gerdab. It's been set up um, where pictures of protesters um, are on the website and they're encouraging general public to identify 
these faces in order for them to face consequences. The fear of those in my homeland country is that the indication is pointing towards things getting worse before they get better. We fear a repeat of the massacres that you've seen on this, in this film, where people might be massacred, tens of thousands of people en masse. We, we don't really know for sure, but we have to make sure that we don't let this happen. My question is, when is enough enough? How many people how many more people must be massacred? How many more dead before the eyes of the world awaken and understand what is taking place? How many more times must the Islamic Republic of Iran lie and deceive people and for leaders of, of so-called Western free countries, you know, allow these um, brutal murderers to, to be welcomed into their countries and to have a regular um, dialogue. These are the questions I want to ask.